beef with Ed Sheeran. I have lifelong beef with Ed Sheeran and it's all because I moved to South Korea. So as I was preparing to live in South Korea, I was just graduating from my senior year of college. You know how it goes, I go to some parties and they always play the same top 40 hits. And at that time, Ed Sheeran's Shape of You was like the biggest song in the world. And you know, it was like a song that I got sick of, but that's how it goes with any big song. You know, you, you hear it too much, and you don't like it anymore. So I was like, whatever. And although it was popular for an extremely long amount of time, Shape of You. Anyway, so that was fine though. Eventually it did die down and I had moved to South Korea. And I remember I was out shopping and I heard Ed Sheeran Shape of You. And I was like, oh, I guess they play it here too. I went to a bar, Ed Sheeran Shape of You. Everywhere I went, Ed Sheeran Shape of You. I found out that big international artists don't push their songs at the same time everywhere. They do it sometimes in markets. So just as I had left the US and Shape of You was dying down, it was just starting in South Korea. And my friends couldn't commiserate with me because they were all living in South Korea. So they were loving this song, playing it all the time. I was hearing it at bars. I was hearing it everywhere. It was in my veins. It was in my dreams. My students who could barely remember a vocabulary word at the beginning were singing Ed Sheeran in shape of you word for word I had to be the one to tell them you can't sing put that body on me it was terrible Ed Sheeran when I see you it's on sight because you ruined my life I can't even hear the beginning chord without absolutely breaking down so yeah Ed Sheeran black privilege tongue in cheek do you believe in black privilege? I know I do, um, because I abuse it regularly. Um, like this one time I was out in Korea, I was living in Korea and I was out at the club with my friends and um, this guy came up to, to my friend and I and he said immediately, I'm a rapper, you know, as you do. And I was like, oh, I rap a little too. And he was like, oh yeah, if you're a real MC, you'll freestyle right now in the middle of this club. And you know, normally I would've been like, if uh, for you know, whatever you say. But I was like a little intoxicated because I was at the club. So I was like, yeah, I'll do it right now. I'll start. So I started rapping in gibberish. Like I was like, it's got my note, a stop below, shut up, but I fought a nika do. And he was eating it up. My friend was looking at me like I was crazy, but he was like, mad respect, mad respect. And like, then he also did his own little rap. And I think it's worth mentioning that he was Korean American. So he definitely should have known that I was rapping in gibberish. And also, my friend knew I was rapping in gibberish. Um, so I think I have to give it up to Black Privilege for allowing me to get away with that that day. Black Privilege, part two. So you guys asked for some more examples of black privilege and I would absolutely love to share. This is satire. If I say a satire in a video and you don't get it, not only did it ruin the joke, but also blame your mom and not me because that's not my fault. Anyway, so one time I was at the club in Korea, in Seoul, the capital city, which is like fairly diverse, but still seeing a group of black people can be kind of rare, um, especially out and about like at the club or something. So we were at the club and there were these, it was pretty early. So there were these two guys and like the us, that was it. One of the guys was like dancing pretty well. So I was like, oh, look at him go. And you know, a um, friend saw him like, oh yeah, look at him. And, and he started to, he saw us and he started to dance a little harder. And we were like, oh shoot, look at him go. So of course, knowing black people, we started hyping him up. And the more we would hype him up, the harder he would dance. And by the end, he literally looked like he could have won. So you think you can dance. He was crumping like in the air, doing crazy stuff. And his friend is looking like, what is going on here? Like we had unlocked some potential in him he didn't even know about. And I was like, you know what? This does feel a lot like a superpower. Like black privilege in the form of like mind control hype. I think that's a superpower, mind control hype. So yeah, black privilege. Restaurant woes. I used to think of myself as a very classy lady, but I don't think I'm allowed to do that anymore because of this story. So I was living in Korea and I had just moved there like a couple months out and there was this restaurant that I absolutely loved that my coworker introduced to me because the food was amazing and also the owner used to always make sure that we were loaded up with side dishes. She would always come over and say the word for side dishes and, and leave it or that's what I thought. So I remember I would have food for like days and one time I came back with the food for, for lunch or something and my friend was like, hey, you got so much food, like that's awesome. And I was like, yeah, I just always make sure to ask for um, extra side dishes and my friend was like wait how do you ask for extra side dishes and I was like oh I um use service you know the loan word that, that Koreans use and the loan word is I'm sure this is this happens in like every language but it's a word that comes from another language and you use it for slightly a different meaning so for example in Korea um, instead of cheating they say cunning so my students are complaining about you know kids cheating on other kids cheating on paper they're like oh teacher he's cunning um, and so I was like oh it's a, it's a loan word it, it, it's service that's the word that they always use and my friend's like no I'm like, what do you mean no? Um, and he was like, no, that's not what service means. Service is like when you go to an establishment and they're being really nice to you and they just give you something for free just because they're being sweet, like out of the kindness of their hearts. So you're walking into restaurants right at the front and immediately asking for like free things. And I was like, I wanted to die. And I realized at that moment that my classy lady card had been totally revoked. Taco Bell Mystery. 
You know, they say that you don't know what you've got until it's gone or that distance makes the heart grow fonder. And I believe that because I didn't know that I loved Taco Bell until I lived in South Korea. So I um, didn't live in a small town by any stretch of the imagination. It was around this population of Chicago, but as an American, they didn't have every chain that I liked. But they had some that I did and they were really random, like Auntie Anne's and Baskin Robbins. They're really big over there. But um, outside of that, you know, there was like no Taco Bell publicly available, which was fine. I was like, I don't even like Taco Bell, but you know, days turn into to months and, and months turn into years and at some point they turn into weeks I guess I forgot weeks but um, I started to feel a longing for the the quesadillas and, and the crunchy tacos that I that I said that I that I hated and um, I had been talking to some of my co-workers outside of one of the classrooms and one of my older adult students heard it and she uh, she smirked and the next time I saw her she came bearing gifts and inside of that bag that she had was a warm and fresh Taco Bell. I still to this day don't know how she got it, um, but re wait, what really got me was how protective and um, shady she was being. She said, you know, I have my sources. I still think about that and that was the best Taco Bell I've ever had. Okay, I actually do know where she got it from. The military base. For some reason, she had access to the U.S. military base in the city and she got Taco Bell from there, but still a pretty crazy story. Unexpected Nickname Growing up, I really never had an appreciation for my nickname, and I never did until I moved to Korea. Um, so my name's Paige. My nickname is Paigey. So growing up, I got the Paigey Wagey on the playground, and my parents called me Paigey uh, to annoy me because I knew I didn't like it. It would make me roll my eyes. Um, so it was whatever. It was just a nickname I didn't really care for um, until I moved to Korea. And so I was waiting to introduce myself to a classroom full of kids, and I was waiting for them to come in. And I remember the door opening up, and I just heard like a chorus of my name, you know. And they were they were saying my name, except it wasn't Paige. They weren't saying Paige teacher, Paige teacher. They were saying Paigey teacher teacher, pagey teacher, because in Korea, that's how my name was pronounced. Um, and I remember for the first time, I wasn't like rolling my eyes when I heard that nickname. I was excited. I was, I felt like I brought a little piece of home with me. So um, after that, I started to appreciate a little bit more when my friends and family would call me pagey because um, yeah, no matter where I go, it goes with me. Language exchange. I like to think of myself as a woman who can accept when she's wrong, and I was definitely wrong about language exchange groups until an experience I had in South Korea. So I had just moved there, and I really wanted to improve in the language. I knew it a little bit, but I needed to do more, and I thought that language exchange was probably like the best way to do that. So I started off, and I was like, okay, I'll just talk to friends. I'll do language exchange with friends, but it ended up being terrible because we ended up just devolving into English. Um, and so I was like, all right, let me let me find something else. So I heard about these like um, uh, language exchange apps, and so I tried out the apps, and I had no idea. Maybe you guys already knew this. They're like tinder on steroids like i would go thinking i was about to have some wholesome experience i've been talking to this person for a little while and the first thing that they would do would be to ask like do you live alone and if you know what that means you know so i was like all right i can't do this anymore i low-key feel like my life was in danger with these apps so um my co-worker actually one of my co-workers has said you know what Paige? i go to this language exchange group you should come with and i was like you know what i have no more options let me just try so i go with him on a weekend and it's like, I remember it's just like kind of like sterile building, giving boring vibes. Because I was like, this language exchange is about to be boring. That's why I never wanted to do a language exchange group because I always thought it was going to be super boring. Um, and I go, and there's like older people there. So I was like, okay, whatever. Some younger people, but a lot of older people. And so I was in one group. And so, um, you know, we did the introductions and then it was time for the topics. And this woman comes up and she's an older woman. Um, and she's Korean. And she what she said made me drop my jaw. She says, you know, I have lots of foreign friends. I think you guys are really great, but I would never even let my son talk to a foreign girl. And I was like, excuse me? When I tell you the whole room erupted, it was like a WWE match. WWF. W, one of the W's and um, they were going at it. They were teaching each other swears, like um, discussing romantic escapades. And like, I was like, yo, what's going on? And then at the end, they would always go out for drinks and go partying. I was like, yeah, this is not what I thought language exchange was like. And um, I don't know if all language exchange groups are like that, but I definitely learned after that, that um, they don't have to be boring. Tea from the boss. One thing about my first boss in Korea is that he was super dope, but he also loved to spill the tea. Like I remember one time we were all talking, he's like, what are you gonna do if one of your students tricks you into saying a Korean swear word and you don't know it? And it's like, man, we were not supposed to be speaking Korean in the classroom anyway, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, but what if they write down on a piece of paper a word that looks like English and they ask you to read it aloud because they're confused about it. You read it aloud, it's secretly a Korean swear word and they're recording you and they use it against you. And it's like, whoa, has that happened here? That's super specific. He's like, no, but it happened in another school. Like, man. And then another time, um, I remember 
he found out that I was making social media videos early on and he said that he researched me extensively and I was like yeah fair enough he's like well it's because there was this one time where there was this guy who was supposed to be working but he was secretly becoming an adult film star in Korea and he was actually a teacher and it was a huge catastrophe for the school and I was like oh my gosh man like just say you want to tell the story skin color so when I moved to South Korea, I was really worried about being treated differently because I am black. You know, you hear stories, but I made um, my own choices. I weighed my pros and cons and decided in the end that I was going to move to South Korea and that it was worth it. But I was always conscious of the fact that that could be a problem. And a lot of times there were issues with me being black. But I remember like with my students, I was most on edge because I didn't know. I, I just heard so many horror stories, right, about black teachers who had been in Korea. So I was ready. I had all my stuff ready. So when finally um, a kid was like touching my skin, like one of my babies, he was like, teacher, why is your skin brown I was ready Girl, I pulled up a video I like had my whole like speech ready and I was telling him how oh my skin has more melanin and melanin means protection from the sky sun and he's like oh, teacher no melanin is bad I'm like I don't have no melanin but no it's not bad there's no skin colors that are bad they're just different and so we talked a little bit more about it and he was like oh okay teacher um and then he, he looked like he was thinking of it I was like okay let me make sure I'm ready for this next comment he was like teacher can I have the iPad and I was like oh he's this little boy not thinking about me and then I remember like a little while longer um, a little while later when I was his teacher again because we went through cycles it's not relevant anyway we went through cycles and um, you know he saw a brown person on the screen and you know some of the kids kind of had like little reactions or whatever but he was like oh teacher he has melanin and I was like yeah so it just goes to show you that um, we do make an impact with the little things that we do if that matters to anybody out there Google Translate Dating you know, I think it's about time that the world opened up its eyes to the beauty of Google Translate dating. If you don't know what I'm talking about because your life is put together, um, I'll tell you what it is. It's basically when you're on a date with someone, you don't speak the other's language, and so you decide to, to talk via app um, exclusively. And, um, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've been in this wacky little situation. Actually, I think it was probably only twice, but it's weird that it happened more than once, right? Anyway, I remember this one specific time I was out on a date um, with a guy, and I remember we talked on um, dating apps. We met up, and we were kind of feeling each other, and we both so that we could speak the other's language and I was kind of like fibbing a bit but you know he was so good I was like you know he'll be okay when we meet up and I guess he felt the same way because when we got to that restaurant it was crickets um and it was awkward for a while but then I'll give him his credit he opened up his phone and he typed up this cute little message on his phone and I was like oh and I typed a message back and he was like oh and we went back and forth and like that and it was pretty cute you know I hear stories all the time about people who like don't know each other's languages at first and slowly fall in love and they exchange culture and romance and language over time and it's like the most beautiful little thing and I haven't quite experienced that yet but I'm still um I'm still waiting and the best part of it is if you don't want to talk to them just go someplace without Wi-Fi gibberish freestyle story well I put myself into a position um so I made a video about black privilege which was a joke which was satire but some people didn't seem to get that it was like social commentary so they tagged me in like think pieces they included me in a think piece sent me dms that were terrible and comments but this was a story about this time that I was living abroad and this guy comes up to me and he tells me he's a rapper immediately because you know black privilege and he challenged me to a freestyle battle for some reason I agreed to it the reason is that I was drunk anyway so we freestyle battle except I did the whole thing in gibberish and he had no idea um and so then he said it was the best freestyle he ever heard and that was that um the people who got it thought it was funny but they asked to hear the actual gibber trap song i'm like that's ridiculous i have a master's degree and i have a job and i'm a grown woman i'm not going to do that except i did it and so some people liked it some people said that it sounded like simlish and the sims even saw it and now people are asking me for a video and for lyrics and uh, that just goes to show you that the internet has real implications because why is that now my most popular song in the u.s in a long time like, I, you know what this means? This means that I'm gonna have to get up on a stage and perform a rap song in gibberish. Um, with my brother, by the way, a very serious man who I convinced to be in my rap gibberish song. So yeah, the internet has consequences is what I'm here to say. Military bass music. When I was teaching in Korea and making music, one of the most difficult things was finding a good recording studio that I liked and had access to. So I used to take recommendations from strangers all the time, like on the internet. I remember this one sweet girl, she recommended to me that I book with this guy that I never met on Instagram and I like booked with him and agreed to like travel and stuff. And like, you know, as you do on the internet as a woman living alone. Anyway, so I remember being excited because it was the same city where my music partner um, lived. So I was like, oh, this is perfect. We can save on transportation. You can come to the studio session. Um, so I remember I had to take a train, like a long train 
between the KTX and I also had to take a taxi. And as I was approaching in the taxi, I was like, this kind of looks like we're in the wrong place because it's kind of looking like a military base around here. Um, and so he pulls up and I was like, is this right? And he's like, yes, this is the address. And I was like, it seems like I might get arrested for being around here. Like I shouldn't be on around here. This is like the US military base, this is serious stuff. Anyway, he drove off and my music partner was late. So I was like, yeah, I think maybe I'm gonna get kidnapped or maybe this is a setup. I'm definitely gonna just like leave. But before I did, the guy popped his head out and it was the guy that I had booked his um, booked the session with. He popped his head out the door. So I was like, okay, I guess that he's legit um, and he can't do much to me on a military base, right? Like this, this is not a setup. And so I remember I went in, like if I was a conspiracy theorist, I would have been like hightailing it out of there. And I remember it was like super involved. Like I had to give my ID and stuff. And I knew that he had worked with the military. I guess I just didn't realize I was gonna be like on the base, like traveling around on the base. And I was passing like fast food restaurants that are like just for like, you know, that aren't available in Korea. Like, oh my gosh. And um, I uh, I went into the military base and eventually my music partner showed up and he signed in as well. And we started recording. And it was like a pretty cool session. It was like in his like bunker. I don't know. It was in his bunker or whatever. And we were recording and we had a little extra time. And I was like, um, I don't know. I don't really have anything planned. And so neither did my music partner. And so he was the guy was like, just do something. You know, you guys just do something on the spot. And we did. And that song ended up being my most successful song in the U.S. Um, it's uh, it's called Crew Soul Version. Um, and it's by me. And yeah, I, it's not my most popular song in the world. In Korea, I have a song called Higher Than That's Most Popular. But my most popular song in the U.S. is called Crew Soul Version. And we recorded it right there on the military base in Korea. That's my crew.